Hello, and welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast, my friend. I have a really special episode for you today. I interviewed Brazilian biologist Fernanda Teixeira, and I was put in contact with Dr. Teixeira because I was going to Brazil, and whenever I travel, I always like to do something related to wildlife, conservation, and in this case, it was more of a family trip. My boyfriend is from Brazil. We were going to a big city, Porto Alegre, so I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of opportunity for wildlife. Although if you check my Instagram, you definitely will see animals there, especially the beautiful parrots. But anyway, I wanted to get in contact with some biologists to really understand um, conservation issues face Brazil and understand what it's like to work as a researcher in Brazil. So that's how I was put in contact with Fernanda. Fernanda is a road ecologist, and she has a lot of background in different things. We talk about some of her work in urban ecology as well working with howler monkeys, and she has done a lot of community conservation and also working to incorporate the government into actually creating action plans to intervene with nature to save species. For example, in her road ecology work or her howler monkey work, we talk about her establishing canopy bridges, some of the first ever designed in the world. So that's quite awesome. She does a lot of really great applied conservation research. So I um, am excited to share this interview with you and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Fernanda Teixeira. Hello, Fernanda. Thank you so much for coming to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I'm so happy to talk to you today. Thank you for the invitation. So first, give us just an introduction about yourself and a little background about what kind of research you do and where you work. Okay, so I'm a biologist and I did my master's and PhD in ecology. I started my first research projects that I got in the, were with howler monkey conservation in a very urban area. So in fragmented areas where they were being electrocuted on power lines or like road killed. So there were a lot of issues related to conflicts with human intervention or anthropogenic infrastructure. And then in during my master's and my PhD, I started working more directly with the impacts of roads on wildlife which is called road ecology. And then afterwards, like I've, I've been involved in different research projects, Project. different topics, but mostly like my main research area, some landscape ecology and conservation in general. And now more recently in the last maybe five to 10 years, not that recently, I've been working also with the improvement of mental impact assessment of different types of infrastructures that just focused on roads. And then now I'm current, currently a postdoctoral researcher at a university in southern Brazil, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And I have a five-year contract. Oh, wow. That's a um, long one. Yeah, but it's about to finish my last year right now in this country. Yeah. Have you been applying for jobs? Not yet, actually. <laughs> Do you have a dream job, like an ideal job that you're striving towards? I like to just be in the different sides of the table related to conservation. So I've been involved in the research part, but also in the public policy, uh, communication, environmental education. So I think I could be sitting in different roles. I have been most of my career within academia, mm -hmm. but I worked at NGOs already environmental consultancy. So I think there's not only one path that I see right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually starting to think about that for the next year. And how did you get involved in this kind of work? Did you always know that you wanted to be a scientist or study animals? How did you first start down this trajectory? So as a child, I always knew I wanted to study animals. So that was the, the thing. Like on the beach, I went for the summer on the beach. Then I wanted to study marine animals at first and a bit of trajectory, really enjoying wildlife. and. Mm -hmm. So I, w I decided to do biology really early on my life, but then what type of job or what I was going to work with, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And then once I started my undergrad in, in biology, 
I got involved in a really cool group, like conservation group that is from my university, that is the Urban Monkeys Program. Mm -hmm. And they work with research, but also with really applied projects, like with environmental mm -hmm. education, with a really strong involvement uh, in public policies. Uh, so as I was part of the environmental committee of the municipality to discuss conservation of different areas. So I got mostly involved with the howler monkey conservation. And I think howler monkeys led me to roads because of them being road killed and electrocuted. And then we had a fishing project with canopy bridges. That was one of the first worldwide, like talking like that there are a lot of canopy bridges started in Australia and other <laughs> like scattered in other places. But this was one of the oldest projects with canopy bridges in the world. And it's a very small project, but it has a nice importance, I think. And then I got involved with this project in the canopy bridge monitoring. And then this was the time that I was starting my master's. And then I decided to keep studying the impacts of worlds on wildlife. Well, did you know that you could become a wildlife biologist when you were younger? I didn't know that was a career for me. I don't know how old you are, but when I was growing up, I knew of just Jane Goodall and that was it. I didn't know it was like a real career option. I did. I'm 27, but like my father is a agronomist. I don't know if that's the way you say it in English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my father is an agronomist and he always worked with the environment. And my mother is a sociologist and we always went camping and mm -hmm. they have a few friends that are wildlife biologists. So I was not super involved with this since, as, since I was a kid, but I knew it existed and I had a relative that was a biology teacher. So I had some relations to biology yeah. and I saw it as a possibility. So you had a lot of good like structure and influence growing up. Yeah, I think so. And at first I wanted to be a marine biologist, but then the university that I went to, yeah. there was only biology. And I think that was the best because I really like marine biology, but I, I never worked with it, actually. So I always worked with terrestrial stuff. And I think there's a lot of conservation and projects that are terrestrial. And of course, I could come back. I know people that did marine biology and then came back to terrestrial wildlife. But it was an interesting choice to keep it broad at first. Yeah, I think it's hard to switch between them. Like, Probably a longer time ago, it was easier to switch. But I think now, unless you have some sort of skill or method or something mm -hmm. that can transfer over, it's a lot harder. So you're working in Brazil now. Are you from Brazil? Did you grow up in Brazil? Yes, I, I grew up in the city that in the same city that from the university that I'm actually working right now. And I lived in and I worked in different universities after I finished my PhD, but I did most of my education in the same universe. And then I did a few postdocs in different places, including Canada. So I also left Brazil for a while. And I think that was really interesting to see different perspectives and also come back. I'm part of a really nice, healthy research group. I really like to work with the people that I work with and all the times that I went to different universities, I always kept uh, collaborating with them. So this was also something that was important to me. How did you get to go to Canada? What kind of research brought you up there? It seems really different from the kind of research you were doing. Yes, I went to Canada the first time. Like I went for an internship for a one month internship in Montreal and Concordia University. But then after that, I went for a seven month period during my PhD because the Brazilian government at that time had a program with scholarships for PhD students to go abroad for a while during mm -hmm. an internship during the PhD. They call it a sandwich PhD, but only Brazilians understand that term. Uh, it's because the idea is that you start your PhD in Brazil, then you go abroad, work in a collaboration with a researcher in a different country, and then you come back and finish your PhD. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's why it's a sandwich. So I did that. And then after I went to Carleton University in Ottawa to work in with Len Leonard Farrig. And then after I finished my PhD, she invited me to come back as a postdoc. And then I went for an eight-month period as a postdoc. Wow. How would you say that 
conservation is perceived in Brazil? Is it something, and I know this depends on who's in power with the government, but in general, is it something that like people really care about and that they work towards? Or is it something more that you have to fight for and that's kind of overlooked? So I think a small part really value it and a small part of the population really values it and recognize the importance. So a lot of people like they recognize the importance of having a healthy environment and how this is related with like in a one health perspective, I would say, but mm-hmm. without a study, but they recognize that things are interconnected and that having like forests or like other native vegetation and wildlife around is good. But at the same time, most people, I think they don't see that connection that clear or like they like animals, but they don't see the importance of even for agriculture, like the importance of conserving different ecosystems and different biomes and how that will interfere with the rain, uh, like the precipitation that will define how much agriculture will be productive, for example. So I think that's a huge gap that people don't see the connection. And sometimes I think part of the population might say that conservation is for rich countries and see a dichotomy between conserving nature and fighting poverty, for example, as if Mm -hmm. these were two different things. And So I think there's a lot of work to do and sometimes there's more space in the government and sometimes there isn't. But even when there is space, like now we are in a better situation than in the last federal government. But even now people see as a dichotomy, like conserving and having like economic development Mm -hmm. and they don't see the opportunities that would rise from being a well-conserved country, I would say something like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say in Brazil that conservation careers are mostly for wealthier people? Because here in the United States, careers are really competitive. And in order to get ahead, you really need a lot of experience, which means volunteering. And a lot of people argue that only wealthier people can afford to take those opportunities. Is it a similar situation in Brazil or is it more of an even playing field? I think the first filter is to get to the university. Our public schools are not as good as the private schools. So most people that can afford that, like wealthier people will pay for a private school to get to the public university because the public universities are the best ones. So there's this thing where you have wealthier people getting free education at the university level because they pay during their elementary school to to get better education. Kind of like opposite as us. Yes. Although we do have private schools too, but I think it's less common here. Yeah. And and it's not that it's easy to get to university, but you can have a good education in a public school there. Mm -hmm. Here, it's like more of like rare cases, like some schools like this is a well-known public school but otherwise if people can in most cities they will avoid public schools so i think this is the first economic filter that we will have for a career in biology but if people once people get to the university and they can graduate of course there is a component of being able to do volunteering and like working for free Mm -hmm. as a research intern but we also have lots like lots of opportunities with scholarships for uh, undergrad stu- students to be involved in research. Like the income that comes from that is not like you cannot pay your entire bills and raise a child if you are a mother or a father, but you get some financial support. And then, of course, we have the, those filters. But once you get to the university, I think you have more opportunity. Going back to your research for the how- howler monkey research, I'm really interested in animals in urban areas. This is something that, at least in the United States, we've overlooked more. We've often gone to like faraway countries to study animals. And just more recently, we're studying urban wildlife. So for the monkeys, did so are they well urbanized? Do they live in really big cities and stuff? Yeah. So the city, where is my university, is one million house. So it's pretty big. Yeah, in the big. So it's a state capital. And what city um, is it? Porto Alegre. So in the southern part of the city, you have like suburbs, but you still have like large demand native forests and grasslands and have quite a, a large population of howler monkeys. Within the city limits, there are like one fragment that is 
like 600 hectares in the city. So I think that's quite big for urban areas. But then you have the cities expanding and sprawling around. It's over this native forest and grasslands. So there are a lot of conflicts with urban wildlife, but they are, so you don't see howlers on the street in like downtown or so, but they have like neighborhoods that are like 40 kilometers from downtown, which have mostly native forest and the orchards on people's yards are made with native trees and are kind of connected with the forest that is around. So you have lots of animals around. What kind of conflict do you have there with howler monkeys or any urban wildlife? There's like the electrocution problem, mm -hmm. which is a big one because the power lines are above the ground and many times they are not insulated. So that's a huge problem. And now they are being like in some areas they were already insulated as a consequence of the public ministry. Uh, this group that I worked with, Urban Monkeys Program, they made and sent information for the public ministry and then they started an inquiry for electric energy company and they were responsible for insulating it but not in all areas so we still have lots of cases of electrocution there's road the kills and there are a lot of dog attacks like when animals go to the ground to cross because they're like the canopy is not connected so they go to the ground and cross so there are some dog attacks and there are other wildlife like porcupines possums yeah. talking about mammals mostly but it's a bird and there's an interesting urban wildlife around here. Yeah, it sounds like it. For the howler monkey research, did that initiate because people cared about the monkeys and wanted to reduce mortality? Or was it more that they were ruining the power lines and like more from a human perspective that we so, protect the power lines? So the program like actually started because there's like starting in 1993, there were a few biology undergrad students that found out there were howler monkeys in the city, not in the mm -hmm. city but in the municipality and of course they lived more close to downtown people that lived in those neighborhoods already knew there were howler monkeys mm -hmm. there but it was a new information for university people and then they started this program to map the distribution of the howler monkeys in Porto Alegre mm -hmm. and that started in 1983 and then they were like going in every forest remnant of city to see if there were how howlers or not and that's the first project project that I got involved with. But then with that happening, people started to see the conflict and then started side projects on environmental education with the community or a side project with the canopy bridges and many other projects that were born from that first one. For the canopy bridges, is that something that the government funded? And I guess they had to be a part of it, right? Or was it something that a nonprofit or just scientists raised money for? Actually, we used to sell t-shirts for raising money and they build them with ropes and... Oh, okay. you didn't yeah, need so government permission or anything? At first, we didn't ask <laughs> in a neighborhood. And then today we can say it's more like a collaboration between the research, like this conservation group and the government. There are like, there's one of the canopy bridges that is installed in front of a protected area that's within the city. Sometime the environment secretary, they land a truck to install a canopy bridge. So there's not an official form to ask for permission to install a bridge mm -hmm. at the site, but there is this kind of informal collaboration. And after that, so the bridge was installed in 2003. This is when I was starting my undergrad. And then today we have the State Department of Transportation called us and say, oh, we are paving this road that crosses the area. And we want you just to go there and say to us if because we already sent to them cases of road kills. So they wanted us to go there and visit the site to see where it's the best place for a canopy bridge. And then now they are, of course, more expensive because they are done with like proper engineering care, I would say, like with the poles to fix them. We At first we fixed them on a tree, but now they are like getting more professional. It sounds like the animals use them and they're successful. Yeah, they use a lot and possums use them a lot as well and porcupines. And this is something that the community got also engaged with, that I did a project with a community monitoring of the bridges and like people would be very attached to having a bridge close to their house and seeing the howler monkeys and really nice yeah story 
How did you involve the community? How did you start that collaboration? So the community got involved with time because we were always there. And then some of the members of the group actually moved to that community because they liked howlers and there's howler, like mm-hmm. there were howlers, there's more nature there, more. So like we have people that are part of the color monkey conservation group that went there and started living there. So there was like once one of the uh, members of the group became the director of the protected area that is close by. So people were getting involved in different ways and recognizing the researchers that were always there, like collecting information and then talk. And then there was this informal engagement. And then we also started to develop a few environmental education projects in the schools that exist there. And people got involved in different ways. And when there was a bridge really close to the house for monitoring 3D, I went there and asked people if they wanted to get involved in the project. Then they're warm, they will feel with the information every time they like had a sighting of an animal cross. I love that. And can you tell us more about your roadkill research? What kind of things do you do? Are you doing field work? And what does that entail? Just like paint the picture more of what that looks like. So I started working with roadkill basically. Like in my master's, like doing field work, like I picked up a road and I wanted to study like spatial patterns of road, kill on that road. Whoa. I would do road surveys very often. And so that's how I started with it. But then now I've been involved in different kinds of projects, like from mitigation implementation to a public policy project with the government where we discuss like the sampling guidelines for environment impact assessment roads. So they're like very different and I would say a broad involvement with road ecology. But mostly in my master's and my PhD, I I studied space and patterns of road mortality. And then after a huge focus on road mortality, I started also studying like the impact of loss by road networks. Mm-hmm. And so there are like dozens of different projects with these kind of subjects. And I think it's really nice because roads, like they are one type of restriction, but they are like, they are everywhere yeah. for at first. So you can study them almost everywhere. Okay. Uh, and at the same time, they have impacts uh, at like they have, if you think of the three major types of impact to have like more mort- like direct mortality connectivity loss and habitat loss or mm-hmm. habitat degradation and this is basically almost the impact of any type of infrastructure mm-hmm. so i think it's interesting an interesting study area because you can go from studying population ecology to community ecology to landscape ecology. So you have different components with one subject. And which animals are most affected by negatively, either by road mortality or connectivity? Which species or groups of animals are are most negatively affected there? So this is another interesting thing of working with road ecology is that you can work with different so you can work yeah. with different animals. So this was also something that for me was really learning process because I worked I worked with amphibians, I worked with mammals, with reptiles, with birds. And then you start learning how to identify these animals that if I worked with only one group, I would not have broad perspective. And usually we see more like carcasses of more common like animals that are more common and not necessarily are the most affected and the carcasses that we don't see might be a huge problem as for example amphibians are a group that are heavily impacted by roads and they are really hard to detect when you're working with kill service especially if you're monitoring by car you don't see amphibians or you don't see only the large ones and so you're just driving along and looking for that yeah so even like you you might maybe driving at low speed but high speed to detect a really tiny truck yeah and they are a group like they are animals that they do not avoid traffic so they go on to roads and Mm -hmm. they will not avoid an approaching car so they are heavily killed on, on roads. And I'm involved in a project that is in the same road where I, I did my master's, where there's like the first, there's the first fence implementation to mitigate the impact of roads on amphibians in Latin America, as long as we know. So this is like a really big deal. It's a really tiny segment, like a one kilometer segment, but it crosses uh, very special reserve that has 
more than 35 species, most of them tree frogs and endangered species of tree frogs, and they were being heavily road killed in this section. It's a high traffic road. And now there's fencing specific designed for amphibians, and then we are monitoring its activeness and like trying at some adaptations for the tree frogs that can cross <laughs> over the fences. I do not respond to your question about the group, but this is uh, just to have a picture of the different groups. Yeah, people don't think of amphibians when they think yes. of them. They pretty okay. much always think of mammals. But within mammals, we have some animals that are often seen as caracoses, but not necessarily they are the most impacted. There is some research on species traits and how impacted the populations are. And what evidence suggests is that species that have lower reproduction rate, large body sizes, and large movement, higher mobility are the most impacted ones because they cross roads more often, they might be killed, and they take a long time to recover the population. So these on one side, but also with small animals, like frogs and other small amphibians, they do not avoid roads. So they have different types of behaviors towards roads, cars, that will determine the potential impact. And the amphibian fencing, does that like funnel them all into one area so they can safely cross? Or does it prevent them from going across the road completely? So we, at this project, we were first concerned of blocking their access to the road. It's a one kilometer section, but there are also, I think it's, five underpass on this action where they can cross. And now our current challenge is to monitor amphibians with camera traps because it's really hard to detect them. To get them to the trigger. Yeah. The technology that we have. There is technology for that when we don't have the money. <laughs> but yeah. What was the coolest animal you've documented with roadkill? Have you seen, or like, what's the most interesting animal you've seen roadkill? Or have you seen anything like really rare or endangered species unfortunately yeah i would say that most wildlife like i've seen a lot of wildlife live on national parks or places but most brazilian species that i've seen road killed mm -hmm. so i've seen cougar different cats we have some smaller cats that are road killed and so usually the first time spotted species is a dead one and then afterwards at some moment i'm happy when i see them leaving yeah that's good well let's leave on a little bit of a lighter note what advice would you have for somebody who is interested in going to a career like this? Do you think you'll always be a road ecologist? Is that the trajectory you're, you're going to continue going down? No, I really like working with roads and there's a nice community of researchers, people like see and call, for instance, I have friends, but I think the uh, knowledge and experience that I got in road ecology, they are easily transferable to other subject areas, especially in conservation, but not only in conservation. But I think of conservation because this is my main motivation. So I'm now involved in projects with invasive species, with power lines. So there are different mm -hmm. railways. So broadening my perspective and also when I did advising students as a postdoc, so you also get involved in people's project, not necessarily my research project. But I think one of a tip is always how clear your motivation and then mm -hmm. you can build the skills that you need for that motivation. So it can really like research, but I don't see myself doing only research and I don't do only research. So I try mm -hmm. to navigate in the public policy arena and in the teaching arena and go and get involved in projects in these different subjects. And this is my tip. I always try to learn something. <laughs> wherever you are doing, there's always something to learn. Yes, I love that. Even if it's a bad experience, like you can yes. learn like how not to be this kind of manager. Like yes, how exactly. not to treat your like, field assistants like this. How you should treat people. And I think this is the most important is be nice wherever yeah. you are. Just be nice because it's really great working with nice people when mm -hmm. you can learn more, you can have fun. That's my perspective. And my last question is what is your motivation? I have two main motivations. One is formation. But I also learning. I have been involved in projects that are not directly related to conservation mm -hmm. or found side jobs, but I always want to learn something. So I really like to study and discover new things and new places and travel. And I also apply that to my career. That's why I don't see myself working only as a road ecologist because I want to learn different stuff. I want to apply what I learned and also get involved in other projects and life projects. I love that. Well, thank you so much. And the next time I go to Porto 
Alegre. Maybe we can meet up and you can show me where the howler monkeys live. Because last time I was there, I did see parrots and some other birds, but I didn't see a whole lot. But we didn't go looking too. Yeah, the next time we can schedule in advance and then I get to see the canopy bridges and That'd be awesome. some wildlife. Yeah, there's some really nice areas in the I want to see two. I've never seen a toucan. I, I I don't think they're in the city, but they're like in the surrounding areas. Yeah. Right? And like, I'm not in Puerto Rico right now. Like there are a lot of toucans in I, the yard all the time. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me and for this invitation. Yeah. Really you're nice welcome. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Fernando, for that interview. It was so interesting learning about road ecology. And of course, I love urban wildlife. I am so excited to go to Porto Alegre again. And I definitely am going to look for the howler monkeys and toucans, like I said. If you want to connect with Dr. Fernanda, she is on Twitter. And her handle is at Fernanda Z-T-E-S. You can find her there and interact with her. So thank you once again, Fernanda. And I look forward to connecting with other researchers from Brazil and learning more about the important conservation work that they do.